Uh, so this will be a talk in two parts, diagnosis and solutions. So diagnosis is going to be about 15 minutes. It's what we think is the essential problem, which is cognitive biases among policymakers leads to worse policymaking. People in government, people like us. Uh, we'll show you some evidence for that. And then Robbie's going to talk to you about the more exciting part, which is solutions. So both team-based solutions, just like super practical things that you could do. You could do when you go back to your organizations, when you go back to your teams. Uh, we'll touch a little bit on that, but the bigger prize is really like how would you kind of permanently solve this? Like what's the structural solution, which we think is forecasting. So yesterday, a lot of the talks I attended, uh, people were talking about sticky nudges. So you can do nudges, you change behavior a little bit. How could you actually make the behavior change stick? So that's what we're going to be talking about. We're interested in what would be a permanent solution to bias policymaking. A bit of housekeeping. We're going to try and keep this interactive. So you may have seen on the preceding slide this. We're going to come back to that later. If you haven't voted yet, don't worry about it. But it's directing you to a website, menti.com. It'll come back, don't worry. Um, we'll have, I know you may have been using Slido so far. So we're going to ask you to use Menti. We'll come back to it, don't worry. And we'll use Slido at the end for questions. We'll hold about 10, 15 minutes for Q&A. OK, let's get into it. Would you please raise your hand if you've ever heard of the Green Deal? Not the US, like New Green Deal. I mean, the UK, <laughs> hands are going down. OK, three people, fantastic. <laughs> OK, so the Green Deal, I'm not surprised. Even people who know about it would prefer to forget it. <laughs> so the Green Deal uh, got going in 2011 in this country as part of the Energy Act. It sought, oh my goodness, it sought to solve what seemed like a behavioral problem. There are energy efficient appliances out there. People are not buying them. People are not using them. So you know, it could be present bias. You have to put down money now, and then the benefits accrue slowly over time. So maybe you're overweighting the cost in the present. Uh, so we'll give, the, the plan was, we'll give people cheap loans, they'll buy the energy efficient goods, and the environment will be saved, everything is great. Um, what I want to call your attention to here is, on the bottom left, basically look how many readings this went through in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. A lot, is the answer. On the bottom right, uh, that's the report, still available online, it's 107 pages long. It's the government's response to every stakeholder concern, raised about the Green Deal, why, why it might not be a good idea, how we could make it better. And this was the result. So four people signed up to the Green Deal six months after launch, which is not great. And it was cancelled two years later. We like the Green Deal as an example of a dramatic policy failure. Um, I say dramatic. I emphasize that because policies fail all the time. Why is this interesting? Because a failure of this magnitude is surprising. It's surprising that we would believe a policy was going to go one way and then it bombed so badly. That suggests that we weren't tracking reality the way we should have been. We had our beliefs about what the world looked like, and then our beliefs made contact with reality, and they were just shredded. That suggests there's something biased in the decision making and the judgment process going on. And the Green Deal failure is not unique. We could talk about things like the uh, top left there, the marriage allowance. So one million eligible couples in this country are still not signed up to free money. It's a 20-minute phone call, or you can do it online, and you get free money. And a million eligible people haven't done it. Top right, tax-free childcare. Uh, Sign-ups for that were 93% less than they expected. So for every 100 people we thought would sign up, seven did. Uh, at a macro scale, two examples on the bottom. So the bottom right, uh, lessons from the Iraq inquiry and the government's report to it. We need systematic checks to counter optimism and confirmation biases in policy. So it's a known problem. On the bottom left, uh, my favorite, and maybe the most horrifying example, have you heard of the major projects portfolio? So it's about like 400, 500 billion worth of projects, so like mega projects that the UK government manages. And the Infrastructure and Projects Authority, the IPA, they release an annual assessment of how it's all going. And in 2018, they estimated that successful delivery was unlikely for 80% of those projects. Like the biggest, most expensive things the government does, about one in five of them are on track. So when you see that many examples, it just suggests that something funny is going on. So last year, uh, we at BIT and the Institute for Government released this report, Behavioral Government. You can Google Behavioral Government. It's available online. It's free. On the way out, somebody will be handing out printed copies if you want. Uh, the lead author, excitingly, is actually here today. Michael Halsworth, do you want to wave to the people? Ooh, come on, yeah. <laughs> they don't even know what it's about yet. It's funny. Um, no, it's fine. That's enough. 
Um, Michael's now leading the bit North America, so he's too important to do presentations like this. So you're getting the B team today. <laughs> Behavioral government, um, don't worry about the arrows. It just basically talks about this problem, cognitive bias among policymakers. And it has this graph on the left. It's just a simple model of how policy gets made. So three stages. Noticing, deliberating, executing. Noticing. Why do we even decide that we're going to try and solve this problem instead of that one? Deliberating. Okay, we decided what the problem is. What are we going to do about it? Let's argue about it. We'll consult our external academic experts. We'll argue about it internally. And executing, the least sexy part. We've noticed the problem. We know what we want to do. Let's just go out there and do it. And then things happen like 93% fewer sign-ups than expected. Maybe because of boring reality details like tax-free childcare having an application form that was longer than 50 pages, which you might not have been cited on if you're a very senior person. But let me just give you examples, and I think this will become uh, more obvious what I'm talking about. So we, we talk about biases at each stage. So at that noticing stage, we've got allocation of attention. Why do you decide to focus on this and not that? So this, there's a lot going on in this graph, but just give me a moment to unpack it. This is a terrific economics paper from a few years ago. It looked at 5,000 natural disasters over a 34-year period, and then looked at how much US television news coverage they got. So I don't know if you can see the blue text. It says, the number of, of deaths needed to receive as much media attention as one death from a volcano, which is like the coolest way to die. <laughs> it's, empirically, it's sudden, it's dramatic. Um, so it compares different uh, natural disasters. So for example, earthquakes and fires. You need two to 12 people to die to get as much coverage as one death from a volcano. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, so storms, floods, and landslides, you need <laughs> hundreds of people. Epidemics, droughts, and cold waves, you need thousands. How many do you need for famines? I know it's a big room, but shout out a number. Be brave. Someone, this part of the room? 10,000, 50,000? 5 million? <laughs> okay, it's not that bad now. I mean, yeah. It's only 40,000, sorry. That's still pretty bad. Um, so, I mean, the, this will be different. This is an international audience, right? It won't be that surprising that in your different countries, there are different topics that get a lot more attention than others, right? In the UK, this ordering would be different. Like, this country cares more about floods, for example. Maybe floods would get a lot of news coverage. But the point is that <coughs> people in, in politics are going to react to what the public care about. And this is what happened here. So it's not just television news coverage, but that coverage in turn correlated with aid decisions, like how willing the US government was to provide aid to the victims of natural disasters. So if you suffer a natural disaster and it's during the World Cup or the Olympics, you're just kind of out of luck because there's only so much oxygen in the media environment. So that's allocation of attention. I love this paper. Um, this is the illusion of similarity bias. So this is policymakers overestimating how much other people share their opinions. And this is a study, it's a three-arm educational RCT in the northeastern United States. And they did, it was, a interv it was a program to try and get parents to sign up to text messages about their child's progress in the school. And like a good RCT, they didn't quite know the best way to get people to sign up, so they tried different stuff. So on the left, they've got like a standard approach. So we just go to the website, sign up, and you'll start getting the texts. In the middle, they've got a simplified approach. So just reply to a text message, like start, and you'll start getting the texts. And the automatic is like, you're in the thing, and you have to opt out if you don't want it. So if they just stopped there, it just would have been like fine and not that interesting. But they did something which anyone could do, any of you could do this, it would cost like nothing, is they asked people what they thought would happen. So 130 education policymakers, people who work in schools, here's the setup, here are the three arms, how many parents do you think are gonna sign up? And the black bars are what they predicted. So standard, you have to go to the website, okay, like 39% of people will sign up, they think. Uh, you have to reply to a text, like 48%, you, you're automatically in it, okay, 66%. So they think one in three people will opt out. So let's just like, look at that standard, the leftmost bar. How many, what percent of parents do you think actually signed up? So the prediction is like 38, 39. What percent do you think it actually was? Five, three, 10, five. five. Okay, you're just overestimating it by a factor of 300 to 1,000%. <laughs> 1%, 1 nobody cares. Nobody cares about your policy. As much as you do. That's the thing to bear in mind, you know? You are swimming in the detail of your policy. You know why it's a clearly good idea. Why would you not sign up? Well, I'm busy and it takes like more than 30 seconds, so I'm not going to. So there are two interesting things going on here, I think. One is 
that they're actually not that bad because they know that they get the order right, right? They know that defaults are going to be more effective than the simplified approach and more effective than having people actively sign up. But they're just way off in the magnitudes. And if I stopped here, this would just be my portion of the talk completely summarized in a graph. Because we don't think that people in policy are completely delusional or incoherent and they don't know what they're doing. They just don't get enough feedback to make really calibrated assessments about the work they do. This RCT might have taken two or three years to run. At the end, you'll get one data point. Okay, I thought it was going to be 1% and it was 39. I've learned something. That's not a very rapid learning process. And in policy making, you might work on policies that take years and you'll learn one thing at the end of them. How did it go compared to how you thought it would go? One more example. Optimism bias, kind of a master bias. This is a study of every blue circle is a real politician in one of the nationally elected parliaments of Belgium, Israel, or Canada. So let's just appreciate what an incredible amount of work that is. I didn't do it, but a group in Canada did. I think it's amazing. So they got that group of politicians, and then they, on the, the bottom there, you see something called an overconfidence index. So that was just created. There's a lot of ways you can measure overconfidence. They did it by asking them, how likely do you think it is you're going to be reelected? And then comparing that to like an objective indicator of the same thing, like looking at polling data and looking at the difference between those things. You can call that overconfidence. And on the, the y-axis, you have a risk-taking score. It's just how willing they were to endorse like a risky policy option in a hypothetical scenario. So there's two interesting things, one much more than the other, I think. The first is just the correlation, right? So the more overconfident you are, the more willing you are to endorse a risky option, which is cool. It's not that surprising if you work in government and you might have a sense that if you're going to write a policy note, you might write it differently for Minister A than Minister B, right? Depending on what you know about their personalities. This person's more risk averse, this person's more willing to take a chance, you might do it differently. What's the other interesting thing about the graph? Ref reflect on it for a moment and I'll give you a hint. Ignore the y-axis. Pardon me? Right shifted, in a less nerdy way. <laughs> Pardon me? Most people are overconfident. Yeah, but everyone's overconfident, <laughs> except one person. <laughs> like the leftmost dot. That person's not even underconfident, they're just like normal. <laughs> and we're not talking about like mild overconfidence, but gargantuan leaps of overconfidence. <laughs> Which is uh, maybe a little bit surprising. It was surprising to me. Why do you think that might be? I realize that's an open-ended question, not ideally suited to a large room, so I'll just answer it. Because <laughs> we've done this like 20 times already. Um, the responses we get from people in government are, well, if you weren't overconfident, you just wouldn't be in politics. <laughs> not in a bad way. I mean, if you went on the campaign trail and you were saying, you know, well, I'm not really sure, but I'll do my best, <laughs> it's just not a message that seems to resonate with people. But, you know, I'll go in there, I'll solve problems, and then, you know, maybe you get re-elected during your lifetime. The world keeps telling you you have good judgment, you're good at your job. Then you tip a little bit, maybe, or a lot, into overconfidence. <coughs> what about people in this room, technocrats, civil servants? Do you think they're less affected by this? About the same or more? So hands for less affected by this. So nerds like us, technocrats, are less overconfident as a group. Okay, about a fifth of the room. Uh, about the same? About a third and more so. Three people. <laughs> okay, how sure are you? <laughs> That's the thing. Uh, you might remember that last Friday we actually sent a survey out. Um, so it turns out we have empirical data on this. It's not looking good. <laughs> so I'll be honest with you, this is quite overconfident. Not hugely so, though. It's actually completely normal. So this is a, a hundred people. Uh, maybe most, many of you in this room completed the survey we sent. I'll show you the methodology in a moment. Um, this is, these are the results. So about 20% of you came out as well calibrated. So this is the first time I've said well calibrated, and that'll be the theme of the whole rest of the talk because that's, that's our outcome measure here. We want people to be making well calibrated decisions. We want a better calibrated government. We'll explain more about what that means. And we see about like 67% of people are overconfident, and we see about five times more people are overconfident compared to underconfident. Overconfident means something like this. You're wrong, but you're sure you're right. Confidently wrong, which is not ideal. So in the, in the we just sent like a simple quiz, right? It was low stakes. It was eight questions. Here are three. Things like a majority of British adults are overweight or obese. Is that true or false? It is actually true. And 40% of you got that right. So many of you thought it was not true. Um, but on average, you were 75% confident in your answer. 
So that's what we did. We asked you a question, true or false, and then how sure are you? And it's that last question that makes all the difference. How sure are you? And ideally, you want these two numbers, correctness and confidence, to track each other, to go up and down perfectly. Right? The more sure you are, the more right you should be. And that's just never the case. Not even a bit. Don't tweet this one. <laughs> um, so BIT's actually an unusual organization. OK, we got mm, a large group of overconfidence. Um, but we have the highest proportion of underconfident people of any group we've ever tested, which I think is a good testament to BIT's willingness to tolerate uh, people who make decisions more carefully and slowly. And on average, we come out as well calibrated. But ideally, you'd want everyone to be well calibrated instead of achieving it in this lopsided way. These are results from the civil service. So these are workshops we've done across the civil service over the last year, almost exactly like yours, so don't feel too bad. And we found that's about 500 civil servants, and that's ranging from the most junior to the most senior. And that's ranging from many, many different departments. Every type of civil servant is in here. And these are the results. About one in five come out as well calibrated. Let's just dwell, dwell on what that means, well calibrated. What would it look like to have a well calibrated government? They would be like weather forecasters and less like doctors. That would be a well calibrated future. So there's a lot going on here. But on the left, that's a study of, I think, nine doctors making 1,500 assessments about whether a patient has pneumonia. So they're asking the doctors, do you think this person has pneumonia? And then how sure are you? And then they compare that against like, an objective indicator of the same thing. So there's a line going up like that. That would be perfect calibration. The more sure you are, the more right you are. And that does not happen at all, right? So you see, the more sure they are that you have pneumonia, it becomes slightly more likely that you really do. But if they're willing to like bet the farm on it, you're, there's like a one in five chance you actually have pneumonia, in that sample at least. That's very poor calibration. People don't like that example because they say, I want my doctor to be overconfident. I want him to be like going the extra mile and ordering tests I might not need, which is maybe true, but maybe you'd ideally you want your, government, your doctor to be well calibrated and just be ordering new tests that you need and only treatments that you need instead of things you don't. Weather, weather forecasters are on the right. Maybe they've got an easier job. They're predicting rain. So that's them on the right side predicting rain. And then if they're 100% sure that it's going to rain, you bring an umbrella, basically. They're very, very well calibrated. The small numbers are just the number of forecasts that they're making. They're making thousands of forecasts. And that's really the, the difference. It's not that weather forecasters are really smart and doctors are dumb. But weather forecasters work in an environment which is just suffused with tight feedback loops. I predict it's going to rain. I'll find out in a few hours. That's not like pneumonia. That's not like policy making. Where I, I'll try a policy, and in a few years, I'll see if it works. And Robbie's going to talk to us now about how we can get to that feedback-rich environment. Mark is coming back. So um, after him being the worst hype man ever, <laughs> given that he's totally deconstructed uh, your own judgment, what I'm going to do is I'm Robbie. I'm from BIT, and I'm, I'm here to help. So firstly, we can think about how can teams improve their judgment. So we're not going to talk about this uh, in any great detail, but you can look up the Behavioral Government Report or pick up a copy as you leave. Um, and that has a much kind of more in-depth explanation about things you can do at a team level to improve your judgment. But a lot of it, to think back to the framework we introduced, is about that deliberation phase. So what are some things that you can do as you're trying to make decisions that might actually help you in your decision making and improve your judgment. Here are three things. Pre-mortems, red teaming, think groups. So I think most of you will be familiar with red teaming. That's just someone in your team who has some kind of allocation in order to be the devil's advocate. Ask, are we sure about this? How sure are we? What are some weaknesses that there might be in this argument? Then at Behavioral Insights team, we, we use uh, what we call think groups. It's a clever change of the word group think, uh, if you hadn't noticed. And basically, that's actually how do you provide anonymous input into ideas during meetings. So instead of doing brainstorming sessions where everyone's writing on a board, but it's often the most senior person who will direct the flow of conversation, how can you use things like Google Docs or other methods to actually just get people to anonymously give ideas, either before or during the meeting, and then you actually assess the, the ideas on their merit, rather than um, on, on the person who said them. And then finally, pre-mortems. So just to give you an idea of what a pre-mortem is, most people have heard of a post-mortem, uh, where you try to understand what went wrong. 
a pre-mortem is before the actual, uh, the, the actual project or event or decision, you actually think about what might go wrong. And this is a little bit different to thinking about, for instance, uh, doing a risk assessment. Because what you want to do is you have everyone in the room who's going to be touched by what this um, project is. So if, say you want the policy person, you want the operational person, you want the technology person, um, and you actually sit down and you think, in two years' time, when this project is finished, we're sitting outside the department, flashbulbs are going off, and the permanent secretary is sitting there, and the journalists are shouting uh, at him or her, what went wrong? Why, why did this actually fail so spectacularly? And the point of this initial session is you get all of these functions in the same room, and you really try to push beyond those kind of standard risks and, and get to the, the ones that uh, you can only really get to when you have that collaborative environment. So again, we're not focusing on this today, but this, what we want to emphasize to you is actually there's some, hopefully some key takeaways that you can take uh, and actually start applying individually and in your teams. What we are focusing on is forecasting. And it's a bit harder, and that's why I wanted to emphasize that there are things you can do already. But forecasting essentially uh, is building on the work of people like Mark Bergman and Philip Tetlock, and it's actually thinking about three things. First, how can we actually quantify uh, these questions about the future? How sure are you is the key question, which we'll come back to time and time again. How sure are you that this policy or this, uh, this initiative that you're pursuing is going to be a success? And let's actually quantify it. Second, how can we introduce much richer feedback loops into the system? Uh, often, especially as policymakers, but also in all organizations, you actually find uh, we are, we're not getting enough feedback, as Mark already uh, spoke about in, one, in the RCT example. It can take you 12, two years, 12 months, two years to actually get real feedback. But this can be, we, we can shorten those cycles, and that's what forecasting can do. And finally, it can also let us know what we don't know. So these are the three things that we think are, are really interesting. So what I'll ask you at the moment, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this question, but if you get your phones out, go to menti.com, uh, put in this code, and you can actually make a forecast yourself. So what, you'll notice a couple of things about this question. By 1 January 2020, the UK will have exited the EU without a deal. No deal. So one thing is, is it's really specific. There's a date, um, and it's actually sh in uh, the near future. The other is we're asking for an actual quantified, uh, a quantified amount. And finally, what we're asking um, is quite specific, right? It's yes or no. So I'll just ask our tech team to now show what the results are for that. So we've got 55 people come in. So already we're seeing the kind of interesting results from the room around forecasting, right? So we actually have some people who are really confident uh, that we will have left without a deal. We also have um, a spike in the middle, so we're not, a lot of people are not sure, and then obviously um, some down the end as well. So what I'd like to do now as well in the room, if you can just turn to the person next to you, uh, who's hopefully already made their, uh, their judgment, and ask them what they did and why they uh, chose what percentage certainty they had. So just two minutes, have a quick chat to the person next to you. Introduce yourselves, obviously. Okay, thanks. So here's a question. You all, you all made your judgment. Now just take like a few seconds to think about what you chatted to with your partner. How many of you would 
change your judgment as a result of the discussion you just had? <laughs> oh, so maybe like 10, 20%. And here is a technique to think about how do you actually improve your judgment. It's, it's quite simple, but it's talking to others, right? Actually trying to test your ideas and test your arguments. And here is one technique that super forecasters use uh, and forecasters use in order to actually improve their judgment, which is finding experts, talking to them, and even just articulating their ideas. The other technique uh, that they often use um, is taking the outside, inside view. And there's, I think, a, a quite fun way to explain this, which is, imagine you're at a wedding. Imagine someone sidles up to you in the wedding, another guest. You're sitting there, and you're enjoying the wine, the dancing is enthusiastic, <laughs> the love is on display, and this person comes up to you, uh, it's probably an economist, I'm an economist, so you know, we can be quite dismal, and they say, what do you reckon? How, how, long, do they, how long do they have? <laughs> is it gonna last? Uh... And you say, oh, the wine, it's beautiful, the dancing, it's enthusiastic. The love, it's in the air. It's, there's only going to be a 1% chance that they're, they're going to break up. This is, this is for life. Now, the economist is a forecaster, and they say, well, actually, if you take the outside view, the Office for National Statistics <laughs> has some pretty clear data on this. And the baseline for the UK is 23% of marriages over 1986 to 2006, were divorced by the 10-year anniversary. So that's one piece of data. Then you might say, well, actually, there's some other data that exists. I'll just look up Google search and actually find uh, time spent dating before proposal. The more time you spend, uh, the less likely you are to get a divorce. So actually, let's take that down a couple of notches. The more expensive a wedding, the more likely you are. So, this is actually a little bit of a cheap wedding. You know, it's, they're, they're, it's not going to shift the dial that much. The number of people attending the wedding. So, if it's a shotgun wedding, only the couple, which is on the blue. That's the worst, obviously. That increases your likelihood of divorce. But then it goes on and on and on. And so, again, you go down a few notches. And then after that, you might introduce what you also know in the room, which is the love, the dancing, and the wine. And so you go down to a 10% chance. But even here, we've gone from 1% to 10%. And this is taking that outside view first, and then the inside view afterwards. Um, and why can't we do this more often just in general policy? And are we doing this enough? So we spoke about the Green New Deal at the start, but obviously there's an ambitious plan in the US, which is the Green New Deal. Um, and so we already have some ideas of what has happened in the past. We have the Green Deal here. We have FDRs, New Deal. How can we as technocrats not thwart any kind of ambition, but actually start to actually understand the details of policies um, and how to actually implement them? And can we actually look at what's happened before and start making better assessments? So we think there's four steps for introducing forecasting to government. The first is setting policy and delivery questions. So by that, I mean uh, the government might have a goal to reduce measles uh, by 20%. That's more of a policy question. But then there's going to be a delivery question as well, especially for people uh, who, are, who are implementing it. And that's going to be something like, we think we have to get 50,000 uh, vaccines out into the country. And so there you have a policy question and a delivery question. And we think it's actually quite important and the, the applications of forecasting are much clearer and more applicable uh, rapidly around delivery. So let's take the Green Deal in the UK. How can we encourage adoption of energy savings products and services? They chose incentives. And then suddenly you can actually start to set a question. More than 50,000 people will sign up for the Green Deal, which was an incentive mechanism, three months after launch. Then you start to forecast events. And so you've got the question, which is actually an extremely hard part of the process. Then you actually forecast those events. So more than 50,000 people 
will sign up to the Green Deal three months after launch. You might send it out uh, in a survey. That's quite a naive way to do it because we've already used some of these techniques in the room, right? So talking to uh, teams, running a tournament, um, or uh, making sure you have all the data in place before you make your forecasts. Then before the event, you might actually start using some of those forecasts. And over time, you start to actually understand how good they are as well as you develop that feedback into the system. So you might start to put in a policy briefing, for instance, or a letter to the CEO. Our forecast is predict a 15% chance of more than 50,000 people signing up to the Green Deal three months after launch. And over time, as you maybe get more certainty or more knowledge about how accurate any forecast is, maybe that's actually going to start to impact your planning. Maybe it will start to make you think, well, we, we want more than 100,000 people to sign up for this to be effective. Therefore, um, are we actually concerned? And then after the event, we are introducing these feedback mechanisms, which we think are extremely <laughs> vital for technology, but they just are not being used uh, for, for policy, but they're not being used enough. So there are the four steps. Um, what we want to do now is, is actually get you to write some of these questions as well. So Mark will come back up and we'll actually start uh, doing this exercise, which actually thinking about, again, going to menti.com uh, um, and using the code and actually inserting some of these questions in yourselves. Okay. If you look at Menti, it should look a bit different now. Is that right? No longer the voting but the question submission stage? Okay. Um, so as Robbie mentioned, this is harder than it seems. So we run an internal forecasting tournament at the bit Christmas party. It's a lot of work coming up with these questions. Um, but these are the kind of main criteria we'd like you to stick to. It should have a yes or no answer. So things like, there's an example of a not great question. Will the deaths of despair come to the UK from the US? It's kind of vague. It's unspecified. When are you talking about? A good question would be, the opioid debt rate in the UK will be higher next year than this year. Yes or no? That's unambiguous. Um, it should resolve. It should, you should know the answer by, let's say, the 1st of January. 2021, not 10 years in the future, not will AI transform the labor market by 2050. That's, this technique is not well suited to that kind of long range forecasting. And ideally keep it policy relevant. You can do policy questions, but like we would love to see delivery questions from whatever area you work in. I know there's people here from all over the world, the Norwegian government, Singapore, if you've got a specific project you're working on, what would be like a really tight delivery question? You could write about that question, about that policy. So please take a few minutes. You can ask people around you if you want to work on it together. It's not as easy as it seems, but I'm sure you can come up with some good ones. And then you'll be able to upvote the questions that you like most, and we'll have a look at them on the screen. So please take a few minutes. Feel free to talk in pairs. Seventy-seven questions. Oh my gosh, this has grown out of control. <laughs> I think we could probably stop there. Yeah, eighty questions is probably enough for a one-hour workshop. Okay, so um, if you want to take another few seconds to upvote the ones you're most interested in, so switch from question generation to upvoting. Donald Trump, he just dominates everything. <laughs> okay, so we have an awful lot of questions. Let's just look at some of them. Jason, could you click on the most upvoted one? Below that? Push, yeah, click, there we go, okay. And push Q again to bring away that screen. Okay, there we go. Okay, this is what everyone wants to know. <laughs> Not what I would have chosen. <laughs> I'll defer to the wisdom of the crowd. Okay, so in 2020, Donald Trump will be re-elected elected, re -elected as President of the United States. It's, yeah, excellent forecasting question. It's precise, it's unambiguous, yes or no. Um, you could easily disperse that out to a crowd and get a pretty good quantitative estimate. Um, will you push down, please, Jason, just to cycle us through the questions? We'll just look at a few more. The UK will experience a new record temperature in 2020. That's really good. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> pretty good, yeah, forecastable. Okay, maybe just two more. Less good. I like the spirit. It could be improved. 
by putting a more precise date on it. Um, okay, there's so much Trump interest here. Um, so these are all, I would say, examples of what we call policy questions. De delivery questions are harder to come up with, um, but maybe would have more relevance to the work you're doing in your own organizations. It's about really holding your feet to the fire. So things like if it's about the measles, if it's about getting vaccines out for measles, we will achieve goal X by date Y. The key thing here is it's not about, you don't have to be sure about everything. You don't need to be able to say 100% we're going to achieve this. You just have to give an honest reading of how likely you think success is. It's fine for government to fail. It's fine for policies to fail, but we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised by failures. We should go into these things with a clear assessment of how likely things are to go. And if it's a 20% chance, then that's fine. I'll take the 20% chance. It's up to government. They're elected. They can choose what they want to do. But it's up to us to give them those honest readings. Can we go back to the slides, please, Jason? And you might say that you know, this would be a pretty big uh, body of work to elicit these kind of questions. But Robbie's going to reveal that we've done it already. <laughs> Yeah, so um, Mark and I don't always ask permission for things. And so what we want to do is actually try this out, just do a proof of concept, actually understand how it works. So sorry, Michael, Ellsworth, um, that this might come as a surprise, but we actually ran a forecasting competition in government with a very small number of people. So, you know, it's only N equals 81. Um, and there, uh, and so we, there's, there's not too much we can take about from this, but actually it's more just to say this is possible and we think it is incredibly informative as well. So we ask a number of questions, and so we'll just highlight a few of them. So the thing that people thought uh, in our forecasting uh, survey would have the, is the greatest likelihood of occurring is the number of measles cases in the UK will be higher in 2019 than 2018. So, and that has a 70% chance. So here we see kind of starting to get information that might be interesting to, for instance, the Department for Health um, or local authorities. Another one um, is between 1 May and 31st of December 2019, a current male footballer playing in the English Premier League will publicly come out as gay. And that had a 37% chance. That was a thing that people thought was the least likely, which might actually, again, kind of highlight how these, uh, these methods can actually highlight kind of things where we might be falling behind in, in areas that we hadn't realized around diversity and inclusion. Then, um, finally, just to highlight another one, the number of homicides by knife or other sharp instrument will be higher in 2019 than 2018. This also uh, was one of, the more, one of the areas people were more certain about. And here, what we think is also quite interesting is variability. So people in the Home Office, which has uh, jurisdiction over this kind of statistic, um, actually uh, thought this was more likely so than, than other departments within the civil service. So here the question is, does the Home Office actually know more? Are they better at forecasting this kind of result? Or are they captured by their own policy environment? And we won't actually know that kind of answer until we get the final results. But we think that is also what is interesting. How good is the Home Office or any other department actually understanding their own policy environments um, or the environment uh, you would be working with as an, orga or as an organization? And actually, um, these results can be meaningful. The other interesting variation we think is actually um, more uh, senior staff were more certain that this would occur as well than, than junior staff. And so again, we start to try to understand who, who actually knows more in these instances. And we did this across a whole range of areas as well in, in order to do this forecasting competition. And again, this is still quite naive. We're basically sending out a survey and asking people um, how certain they are that things will occur. But here, what we're trying to illustrate is this isn't some kind of far off thing in the future. This is something you could do in your organization about delivery goals, for instance. Are we going to get that product shipped? By what point? Is this RCT going to work? Um, how sure are we? What is the, um, what is the actual uh, percentage point change that we think is going to happen? And as, especially as knowledge workers, but off, across all sorts of areas, why can't we build in better feedback loops into what we're doing? And this is ways to do that. And over time, what you'll see is judgment can actually improve. And basically, that's what we're trying to build towards. Most organizations and government Basically, today, sit here. We have little to no understanding of their calibration, although we're pretty sure, given the results that we've already explored today, that most of us are overconfident about 
um, our ability to deliver uh, certain policies. So here we have what the reality is, for instance, and on the bottom would be like what is the forecast. And at the moment, all we really know is probably that our guesses about the future are overconfident. What we want to do is simply introduce, in the first instance, how do we actually just start measuring some of those things? So what we have today, what would tomorrow look like? How can we just at least just understand that calibration, understand if the home office is captured or if it's actually a good forecaster of information? And so how can we just track data and forecasts of government, departments, teams, organizations, and just start to actually understand um, where people's uh, calibration sits? And then the dream, and actually, if you're familiar with the website 538.com by Nate Silver, um, they, they do this now for all of their uh, assessments of the future, is actually how can we understand how well calibrated we are um, and how can we improve that calibration through uh, the feedback that we actually generate through the system. And so how can we make sure ultimately that we're sometimes wrong, we don't always get it right, but we're, at, but we're, we're rarely surprised. So that's the end of the session. So remember, stay calibrated. Keep on doing uh, calibration surveys. You do get better over time. Um, cognitive biases do lead to worse policymaking. But we know there's also people who aren't policymakers in the audience. What we also know is this also affects organizations. Ask your team, just how sure are you about the next time that they ask, bring forward an initiative? And this is different from are you sure, which people will instinctively say yes, I am sure that's going to happen. Whereas if you say, how sure are you, you're giving them space to actually explore some of that uncertainty. Forecasting is a potential structural solution to this problem. Hopefully you agree. Maybe you don't, but that's why we're going to have a Q&A now. Um, and also we're going to send out an email uh, next week summarizing a bunch of those small things you can do as well as where you can get more information. I guess uh, to conclude, I guess if you're wondering... Uh, whether this is possible, whether you can actually make this kind of change, the question we would ask back to you is, how sure are you? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
Right? It's, like, it's like betting markets. I mean, if you're predicting really complex issues, things five, 10 years away, maybe you wouldn't bet your mortgage on the forecast that you see. It might still be the best thing available. And as far as I know, the evidence in this area suggests that this is a very good method for our forecasts in that one to two year horizon. I mean, Nassim Taleb has a critique of, like, of the Philip Tetlock approach, which is basically along the lines of, you know, the things that you can forecast aren't really that important, and then the things that uh, you can't forecast are the things that are important, like the black swan events is what he would describe. So that, that is definitely kind of a legitimate critique. I guess the, the question, though, is we're, we're still in the question mark box. So we don't, don't even know how good our judgment is, and this, we're making thousands of judgments across a year, if not more. Um, so we can definitely measure a good proportion of those, even if we can't measure every black swan event. We'll come to the questions on the screen as well. Soon. Uh, please, how do you believe mood could interfere with forecasting? Like, uh, have you checked specific kinds of moods? Overconfidence is one, of course, but uh, would there be others that would either improve or make them worse? Thank you. How can mood affect forecasting? Yeah. How you feel? Um, that's a great question. I recommend Twitter as a way to follow super forecasters in the wild and see how they think. think. There's a lot of them on it. I mean, they have got no followers because they're not very sexy. <laughs> You'll see a, you know, a New York Times journalist with four million followers, and they just write very vague articles where you never really know what they're saying. And then the number one forecaster in the world is on Twitter. He has, I think, 35 followers. <laughs> he mostly tweets about ice hockey, but he is very good at what he does. And from what I've observed of them up close, I'm not a super forecaster. Um, they get affected by emotion like everyone else, um, but before they make their judgments, they're able to separate that because they prize accuracy above everything else. I don't think mood really improves their forecasting ability. They're just unusually good at you know, feeling you know, like a human, being upset. But when it comes to forecasting, they price accuracy above all. And I guess we should, so in super forecasting, which we didn't really explore as much mm -hmm. here, but obviously if you start to have mass scale surveys of forecasts, there are going to be some amongst us who are super. Uh, so and they're the super forecasters, essentially. And what Philip Tetlock and Mark Bergman find in their work is uh, it's not ever clearly obvious who that super forecaster will be uh, based on kind of the characteristics that we often assign uh, for credibility in our biased society around kind of age, uh, gender, uh, experience, all these kind of things. And actually, for instance, uh, in some of Mark Bergman's work uh, in, in a biomedical field, the kind of the veterinary science student who just started um, she was just as good, if not better, than the, uh, the vet professor who'd been there uh, for you know, two decades. And then another famous example is you have essentially a four-star general um, and their forecasts are slightly worse than the part-time, flexible-working mum who just is amazing at Googling and loves listening to BBC World Service. So here you kind of see suddenly you get quite different distinctions around what you can actually understand about who is good at forecasting. Um, and what you find is when you cast your wet net wide, you start to actually understand within your sample who actually, for instance, in the civil service or your own organisations, who actually might be really good at being cal calibrated in their judgments about the future. Uh, hi, um, I work for Gamble Aware, um, the charity. Uh, um, we have a complex situation where there is, we deal with diff different departments. So the DCMS, our minister is the Minister for Sport, but she's also the, or he, don't know which one it is now, is the Minister for Gambling. Um, and so you, we have cognitive bias amongst different departments. Um, obviously, we've got the Department for Health and Social Care, so, and also super forecasters in each of these departments. So what would be your um, experience of, uh, of those sorts of complex environments, policy environments? My experience of working with super forecasters in government? No, of the, sorry, of the, of the cognitive bias amongst different departments and where, you know, who trumps who. I don't want to point fingers. I'm as affected by cognitive <laughs> bias as anyone. Um, I think you can point to individual examples of bias leading to policy making or affecting in a certain way, like we did at the start of this talk, but we moved on from that because it's not an individual level problem. 
we think. It's a structural level problem. You might work in an organization where overconfidence, cognitive biases are effectively rewarded. Right? So you, you know, if you're an underconfident person, or a person who's a little bit meek but makes well calibrated judgments, perhaps you're not getting promoted. Perhaps your ideas aren't being put out there. So you can do things we've been talking about, team level solutions to try and correct biases, make a team very de-biased and high performing. But the bigger prize is how you fix the whole structure, we think. We're less interested in like individuals who are unusually de-biased at the moment. Does that make sense? But we can I, I think one thing to think about is that structure around noticing, deliberating, and executing. And just understanding it's, this isn't a civil service problem, it's an mm -hmm. organizational problem, right? It could, the report could almost be called behavioral administration as well. Should um, we look at the screen? We don't have much time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so I think just thinking about these aspects uh, when you're dealing with policymakers is quite important around how are they actually noticing the problems on their plate. That's a terrific question at the top. How do you use low probability forecasts to shape policy? If the probability is low, if we say there's like a 2% chance, won't it be scrapped? Should it be? Okay. I mean, if, if that's our true assessment, what, what's the alternative? Should we not say that? Should we just rely on words and describe it vaguely and say, you know, we think there's a small chance, we actually mean 1%, but we'll just say small? Um, up to, I think, the politicians to make decisions like that. Technocratically, all we can do is give the most accurate assessment that we can. That's my opinion. You might feel differently. And I did recently see a statistic that alarmed me from the 60s. It was a newspaper clipping of a person who bet on the US to land on the moon by 1969, which they did. And he got odds of one in a thousand. So the consensus was there was no way that was going to happen. And if you had been blaring that information at the very start, maybe we wouldn't have landed on the moon. That's not an uplifting message to end on. <laughs> we have time for one more question? Yeah. You want to take one? Are uh, there peer-reviewed studies that assess the effectiveness of calibrating solutions in the field? Um, or might we be overconfident about them? No. So, I mean, the, the first is yes. So we, if you're really interested in this, um, there's a rich kind of literature, uh, which we've based most of this talk on today by Phil Tetlock and co-authors as well as Mark Bergman and co-authors. And they do use quite rigorous methodologies that uh, mean that we have a reasonable amount of confidence that what they're doing uh, makes sense and works. But like any good academics uh, or anyone approaching this field, as well as anyone who's actually saw Dan O'Reilly's talk this morning around the kind of changing nature of um, the environments we work in, we should always you know, retain some healthy skepticism about what we're doing as well. Okay, should we just do one more? What's the purpose of forecasting? We didn't do a good enough job during our talk, <laughs> evidently. Um, it seems like people make forecasts like guesses. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I understand what you mean. It all comes down to the first few weeks, the first few months that you do forecasting. You might feel this is a bit nebulous. What am I learning here? It all comes down to when you can start tracking accuracy. You don't, the process of forecasting is useful. It makes you think more carefully. Um, but what you really want is people who make very accurate forecasts. So, and that would be incredibly valuable, we think. There's 400,000 civil servants in the UK. If 1% were super forecasters, that would be a cadre of several hundred people who give really, really, really reliable policy advice. So when they're sure there's like, you know, a 90% chance this policy will go well, that's useful to know. When they're telling you there's a 10% chance it will go well, maybe that's a sign you need to run a pre-mortem on that project. You need to get into the detail and figure out why they're very skeptical of its likely success. And I think, I mean, we, we, talk, we spoke a lot today about like, a lot of the outcomes of what this approach would look like. But actually, as Mark was just mentioning, the process is actually incredibly interesting and important in itself. And this is what some of the work of Phil Tetlock has shown, which is the process actually helps improve people's <coughs> judgment. So if you think about, for instance, a question like Brexit, which for a lot of people is quite emotional, it's quite, uh, you know, it's quite significant in kind of the way that they already have their entrenched views on it. If you ask people more to say, well, do you want to bet on that outcome? How sure are you about that outcome? It actually forces people to consider all sides. And that might actually start to change some of the judgment. And that's what they find in a bunch of uh, tournaments that are being run, which is actually, um, it actually moderates people's, um, it moderates people's decisions and actually enforces them to actually think about all sides of the argument rather than necessarily the one that's they're think been thinking about because of motivated reasoning or, or other reasons as well. Okay. I think that's our time. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming. We'll stick around and, uh, yeah. <laughs>